As we move into our next unit of study, we're going to be learning how microbes affect the foods that we eat. This week, we started learning that microbes can spoil our food and literally make us sick. Sometimes, it can make us so sick that we could die from it. We call this food poisoning. The Bible even uses a kind of microbe, leaven, we call it yeast, as an image of something bad. Leaven or yeast is a fungus that ferments sugars and is used to cause dough to rise. And we enjoy donuts and bread and pastries and all sorts of things with yeast. But the Bible uses it in a different way. Did you know that leaven is used as an image of that which can spoil righteousness within our hearts? Now first we need to understand where righteousness comes from in order to really learn what can spoil that righteousness. Now the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. In Isaiah 64, 6 it says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. So this righteousness that we're going to talk about today, it can't possibly come from us, because from us only comes filthy rags, in comparison to what true righteousness is. So what is this righteousness? It has to come from something outside of myself. I can't produce it on my own. So true righteousness comes from God. When we come to know Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, He comes to live within us and He makes His home inside of us with our soul. In this way, Jesus loans us His righteousness through the Holy Spirit who actually resides in us. So anything that breaks the fellowship we have with the Holy Spirit will begin to spoil the righteousness that we have. The Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What do you think grieves the Holy Spirit? Well, let's see what Ephesians 4 has to tell us about this. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Having lost all sense of shame, they have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with a craving for more. But this is not the way you came to know Christ. Here's the key, guys. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him, in keeping with the truth that is in Jesus, to put off your former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. Did you see it? There's the true righteousness and holiness. It's something we put on, and it is Jesus Christ. It goes on and says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun set upon your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing good with his own hands, that he may have something to share with the one in need. And let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up the one in need and bringing grace to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, and anger, outcry and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and tender-hearted to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. That's a whole lot of do's and don'ts. So should we just go through that whole scripture there, pull it apart, make a list of do's and a list of don'ts, and make sure to do everything on the do list and nothing on the don't list? Is that how I stay righteous? No, that's not how we do it. Because remember, our own righteousness, no matter how hard we try, is as filthy rags. So I need Jesus Christ, and He's the one that makes me a new creation. The way to keep my righteousness from spoiling is to always stay close to Jesus. I think about the Petri dishes that we grew bacteria with. In the lab, sometimes they'll put antibacterial, and the germs can only grow so far, and then they stop. And this is the way it is in us. When we humbly stay close to Jesus Christ, He protects and purifies us from all unrighteousness. Realizing that I cannot be righteous on my own helps me approach God as a child should, with my need and honestly admitting it. 1 John 1.9 says it this way, If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, the key is Jesus Christ. He's the one that's purifying. He's the one that's making me righteous. It isn't in being good enough, but rather coming to the one who is good enough and asking for him to make me his good. Remember that the Bible uses yeast or leaven in a general way to represent sin. We started there. Why do you think yeast is used in this way? What is yeast good at? Well, it's good at spreading throughout whatever it's in and influencing it completely, right? It puffs up whatever it's in and fills it with empty space, making it large and puffy. Sin does the same thing, and even just a tiny bit can have a big impact. Sin is the same exact way. Paul says it like this. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And he's not just talking about sin leavening all of me and puffing me up and filling me with emptiness. It, it does that to me, but it also does that to the church. If we allow sin in, it'll puff it up and fill it with emptiness and make it unproduct unproductive. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the new unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So the yeast of malice and wickedness can puff up and make a mess out of our church and out of our lives. But the unleavened bread, it represents sincerity and truth. So we have already seen that boasting is one of them from Paul. Jesus also taught about the power of leaven to spoil our righteousness, not just Paul. He says, there's the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of that. Matthew 16, 6 says, And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. While Jesus doesn't define the sin of the Pharisees in Matthew's passage, we don't have to be in the dark as to what it was really about. It's an overwhelming characteristic of the Pharisees. And it's clearly stated for us in Luke 12, 1, which states, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Saying one thing and doing another putting on a religious show outwardly when in your heart you're really far from God. That sounds a lot like yeast. They're puffed up, looking better than they really are. They're full of a bunch of air, just like bread is when you use yeast. The next one Jesus used was the leaven of the Sadducees. The verse goes on to say, and Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. The Pharisees were known for their religiosity and their hypocrisy, but what about the Sadducees? What was their problem? Well, I like to remember what the problem the Sadducees had by remembering their name. They're sad, you see. Well, why are they sad? They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe the angels existed. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they're very sad because this is the only life they have. There is nothing spiritual. All there is is physical. They were the spiritual skeptics of their age. What is the leaven there? Well, if I don't believe in the supernatural, I cannot believe in a God who created everything by speaking it into existence. I cannot believe in the God who fed 5,000 with loaves and fishes that he created on the spot, or a God who raises the dead, or a God who raised himself from the dead, a God who parted the Red Sea, a God who spoke out of a burning bush. All of these things, all of these supernatural events, I don't believe in, and that is a yeast that puffs up with a bunch of emptiness, emptiness in my soul, emptiness in my purpose, in my reason to live and to even be here, or the reason for you, and why should I love you? Because if there is no supernatural, then I don't go on when I die, and you don't go on when you die. I have no value, you have no value. How I treat myself or you does not matter. So this is another yeast that Jesus says, beware of this yeast. Do not lose the faith that you have and the hope that you have for the supernatural. The next leaven that he talks about is the leaven of Herod. Mark 8.15 says, He was giving orders to them, saying, Watch out and beware of the leaven of Herod. Now Herod's an interesting case. He was in a very powerful position in the world, and he wanted to see a sign from Jesus. And there are several warnings here. One is against the desire for worldliness and power that can easily spread and unfortunately 
it looks a lot like our Western church today, and it looks a lot like many of the Christians today. We want so much popularity and power, and that causes that leaven to grow within us. It's empty, because popularity and power do not satisfy, and they do not make us into the people that we really desire to be. But the other warning is in combining this through seeking signs and wonders and attempting to gain greater power. You see, if I have power and I can seek a sign and a wonder, then maybe I can have even more power because I can use the, the wonders and the signs to enhance my power that I have over other people. Don't seek for popularity. Don't seek for others to know you. Don't seek to make a legacy of your own, but rather seek to make God known. He is the only one that's worthy of being popular, of having the power. And when we see signs and wonders, we want to point people's attention to Him and to His power because it's Him that's doing it and not us. The, the Apostle John said this really well. When they came and approached Him one day and they said, Hey, John, that guy Jesus, he's getting, some of, he's getting more followers than you and some of your followers are leaving to, to join Him. And do you know what John said? John said, I must decrease and He must increase. He understood that he was here to point people to Jesus. And when their eyes turned to him and they followed Jesus, he went on to help another person follow Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to point people to us and have a following of people following us. We're supposed to point people to Jesus. The next one he talked about was the leaven of legalism. Galatians 5, 7-9 says, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. The problem in the Galatian church was that they started with faith in Jesus only, but they were soon persuaded that they needed just to add this aspect of the law, like observing a certain day, or this aspect of the law, like circumcision, or just this one about righteousness by how good you are. And so their faith became Jesus plus those other things. And Paul taught them that this was not from God. And it was in fact a leaven that quickly puffed them up with emptiness instead of righteousness. We can't be good enough. Okay, then there was the leaven of immorality. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1, through 1 and 7, it says, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb also has been sacrificed. Okay, and so here in this verse we see that the context is talking about sexual immorality. Uh, in, in, in first century Corinth there was basically this attitude of anything goes. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of the United States right now. Anything goes. Just as long as you're happy, go ahead and do what makes you happy. Not considering that your acts are what God says in his word, immoral. Paul correctly identified this immorality as a leaven. And he says, don't let that fill your Christian life. Don't let that come into the church. Don't let the immorality of your culture around you be justified and brought into your world and brought into the way that you live or the way that you say it's okay to live. If God said in his word that this is immoral, then is it right for the church to side with the culture or should the church be siding with the word of God? It's not the job of the church to judge the world, but it is the role of the church to maintain and obey God's word within it. What I want to leave you with is I want to talk about what's the unleavened bread look like then? What does it look like to be unspoiled? Uh, to have righteousness that's not of myself, but of Jesus Christ. Well, the unleavened bread in scripture speaks of the total sinlessness of Jesus Christ. You see, that's why he is the unleavened bread. He never sinned, not even one time. Do you realize that if Jesus had committed just one sin, that he could not have been the sacrifice for our sin? It had to be a lamb without defect that was sacrificed at Passover. And it was bread without leaven that was eaten at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So when you think of all the different ways that a person gets led into sin, it is incredible that our Savior lived his whole life without failing one time. But that is what he did. 
And the Bible records it very clear for us. It says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 1 John 3, 5. It also says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. There it is. He loans us his righteousness. Here's another one. Did not Jesus tell us that he is the true bread? He is the unleavened bread on whom we should feed. John 6, 32 through 35 says, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus is our righteousness. And when we have fellowship with him, it's like that Petri dish, that the, the sin of the world, our own sin, it cannot come anywhere close to us. Now, when I live as a Christian, sometimes I do sin, right? And that sin can break that fellowship if I don't come to him like a child and ask for his forgiveness. I did this experiment in the classroom the other day, and it's a good showing of what happens to us if we allow any of these spoilers that we just talked about access into my life. It can quickly turn us from being a pure heart to making us very dark. So we can go from being transparent so that you can see right through us and see Jesus Christ inside to being so dark and full of sin that a person looking at us can no longer see Jesus. And that's what this experiment shows, is the spoiler of righteousness. When I choose to live in sin and continue in it, I become darker and darker and darker until I just, you cannot see Jesus anymore when you look at me. Now as a Christian, I will sin, that is true. But if I come humbly to him and ask for his forgiveness and I keep the fellowship between Jesus and I, he can cleanse my heart again and he can clear it up and he can purify it and make me transparent again so that people can see him once again.